I want to thank everyone uh, for sake, taking some time out of their day to be on the call. Uh, if you're on the computer, if you're using the Zoom right now, uh, there are slides that Ryan will be using. Bear with us as Ryan will be talking and I'll be controlling the slides uh, uh, from two different places in the country. So bear with us on that. Uh, I just want to acknowledge, I know these are, are really tough times, uh, obviously working from home um, and, and everything that's going on. So I appreciate everyone taking some time out of their days. Uh, I know it's been quite chaotic, but we thought it was important uh, not only to have the communication with Scott and myself, but also to, to bring in LPL as our trusted partner, uh, just to have some communication and kind of understand uh, how LPL has been helping us and kind of their viewpoint. Um, just know that our team's been working very hard uh, through this time. Uh, I think it's a, a, a time showing a real stress test on the portfolios. Um, it's showing that our diversification is working. A lot of our bond holdings, for example, are holding up their weight really well, giving us the ability to rebalance. Also, for most of our strategies, we took some serious action um, as this uh, virus outbreak started to happen. Um, raising a lot of dry powder, which we've been putting back to work. And most of you have probably been seeing that happen in your portfolios. Um, so, I'll give uh, Scott, can you hear me? Are you, is your volume working? Scott, I think you're on mute still. One yeah, second. So I just unmuted it. Can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, hi, everyone. I'll just take uh, a few seconds and uh, just do want to uh, a thank everyone for trusting in our advisory services. Like Chris said, our strategies are absolutely working. Uh, we can't make a blanket statement that uh, you know, uh, all portfolios are either down X percent because we have, you know, again, so many custom strategies. But uh, one thing that uh, if you're in uh, part of your portfolio or your portfolios in our, our stock strategies, we're doing very well compared to the market. Uh, you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised, although we're taking on some order. It's natural. Like Chris did say, we raised cash. We've been deploying it strategically. Uh, and uh, obviously, we also have LPL behind us, research that we listen to and helps guide us. Um, but just two quick points. Uh, they may sound a little hokey, but uh, a lot of you have heard us say this during our, our meetings, and it was really a, a statement, a philosophical statement uh, by John Templeton, who once said that, uh, you know, in these bear markets, that money does return to its rightful owners. And we are a believer in that. And it, and it typically does return back to its rightful owners over a period of time. Albeit this one, I don't think will be as long as others. I think we'll, we uh, will absolutely get you through this. So thank you for trusting in us. And uh, I'll keep quiet now toward, until the end and we'll turn it over to Ryan. And thank you for attending. I'll mute yeah. All right. I was going to give a little introduction to Ryan, uh, just so everyone knows. Uh, well, I, when Ryan first came on, for those who were on the call, came on a little bit early, I was just letting Ryan know that LPL has been a wonderful partner in all this. And we've seen literally no interruption to our business, which is quite amazing since there's, like Ryan was saying, usually 3,000 people in his office that are our support staff. And there might be 100 there right now. And you wouldn't even know. Um, so it's just quite amazing how LPL was able to to kind of turn on a dime and, and figure out how to operate in this new uh, this new world we're all in and uh, just been an amazing support staff. Additionally, LPL has been coming out with a lot of great research with Ryan and his team putting that together. Uh, so Ryan is LPL's chief market strategist. You've probably, if you're watching CNBC, you've probably seen him on there from time to time. Scott and I always like to say when we like to see LPL on CNBC and obviously it's because it's LPL, but really because when LPL comes on, I think everyone kind of shuts up and listens because, Ryan, you guys are offering a, a really a true unbiased view. There's no investment banking, no proprietary products. So you're not on there to, to talk up an investment or to talk down a short or something like that. You guys are just out there giving unbiased uh, feedback, which I think is it's always been important. Um, but in the news these days, it's even more important because there's just so many biases out there. And LPL can be kind of that trusted source. So today, Ryan's going to give us a, a, like a 30,000 foot view of the markets, give us some historical context, 
and also maybe what like a road to recovery looks like. Um, yes. So Ryan, again, thank you for, for joining us today and uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you guys. Appreciate it. So good afternoon, everyone. As Scott was saying, he, he said, you said a, a quote there, Scott, that struck me and I, I save quotes also. I've got an email string and here's one from Warren Buffett, similar to what you just said. The stock market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. Oh, that, that's kind of a building on uh, kind of what you said there about bear markets and the rightful owners. So, so uh, Ryan Dietrich, senior market strategist with LPL. I've been here four years now. We're just south of Charlotte. We've got a really big campus. If anyone's ever in Charlotte or just south of it, we're in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Uh, let me know. Love to show you around. Uh, I live just a few miles away. I am in the office today. I go a couple days a week when I'm doing you know things like this. I do the TV stuff. I was on TV not this week, but last week. Um, we have a neat studio where I just throw a tie on and go and push a few buttons and you're on TV. So I, I enjoy that. But as a market strategist, I get to do fun things like this. I'm a big voice on our team. We've got about a 30 person research team. We manage over $30 billion. And as Chris, you were saying, lots of strategists go on TV, talking heads, right? They pontificate and they talk about this or talk about that. I think what, what LBL's on there, when it's myself or someone else, what we're talking about is how we're investing money right so if we're right hey that's great if we're wrong it's not just oh well, that's okay there is a major impact to that so that's the one thing about lpl and again we don't have a bank and we're not we don't have all these deals with different places we give our unbiased opinion that is very out there and you know advisors use us clients use us different people uh, can follow along and there's lots of different ways that we uh, we get our message out there. I'll kind of talk about some of those. But really today, obviously, we want to focus on a couple different things. But clearly, front and foremost, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic that's taken this grip of the country and grip the world, I guess I should say, and kind of how that's impacted things. First things first, did LPL Research see this coming? No. We would have done this four months ago. We would have said, you know, stocks maybe can gain a low single or high single digits. Economy would keep going, the 10 year record of economic growth would keep going. Reality is, this happened. We didn't see it coming. A lot of other people didn't as well. And now we've had a 34% correction, the fastest bear market in history. We've seen, um, you know, just an economy that was chugging along pretty good in February. The economy was actually turning higher. The SP made new highs on February 19th, and it all just came crashing down. And as you can see here on the screen, you know, a good quote from Warren Buffett, once a decade, storm clouds will come and it will rain gold. Get your buckets ready when it does. We think now's the time to get your buckets ready. That doesn't mean this is the lows. Was March 23rd, a few weeks ago, the ultimate lows? You now, you don't really know, but what we do know is history tells us when you pull back 34%, yes, it absolutely could go back lower if you get more negative news on the COVID-19 uh, front. But the bottom line is so much bad stuff's priced in. Like I like to share this chart here. CNN Money has a fear and greed index. Very simple, one to 100. And it's a proprietary indicator. They look at like put to call ratios, investment polls, sentiment polls, money flows. Long story short, it hit a one back on March 19th. It's the all time low. It hit a two on uh, December 24th of 2018. Remember the Christmas Eve lows when the stock market was crashing back in late uh, 2018. So this was blood in the streets, that old saying, you know, buy when there's blood in the streets. And that, it's never quite that simple. We're going to talk about our road to recovery, but this is a positive sign. When everyone is washed out, that can be potentially where markets bottom. Here's the catch. The week after, there was more fear than there ever was in the market's history, according to this one particular indicator, stocks were down 15%. So again, it, now they bounce back and we've had a really good rally the last couple of weeks, but still it's really important to know just because everyone's fearful, that doesn't mean markets cannot stop going down. They don't, they, they absolutely can go down. So that's, um, that's uh, just something I wanted to point out. Let's go to the next chart, Chris. Um, it's good to be prepared. And right there you can see is an image of my bathroom. That is how we prepare in the Dietrich household for what's going on. <laughs> anyway, obviously it's a, I like to use humor a little bit, but no, this is serious, so we'll get to some important stuff here. So what just happened? The Dow has been around for 124 years. S&P went to 500 stocks, I think it was 1956. But look at the Dow. We just had the fastest bear market in history. 
bear market, I'm calling that from an all-time high to down 20%. As you can see, it was 19 days, breaking some of the previous records, times like 29, times like 87. I mean, just talking uh, 1917, World War, uh, World War One. I mean, you're talking there are some significant sell-offs. What we all just went through was the worst ever. Think about this. So the Dow's been around a long time. The average absolute value change per day last month was 5%, meaning that's plus or an absolute value is plus or minus. You make it a plus sign. But the average day moved 5% in March. The previous record was November of 1929. It didn't even crack 4%. So there's different ways to look at it. But I don't think it's too out there to say we just had one of the most vicious sell-offs in stock market history, and we probably had the most volatile month in stock market history. And again, there are some big up days, too. I mean, don't forget, big up days tend to happen in bear markets, unfortunately. You think back to 2017, um, or 2019, sorry, last year, really good year. We didn't have that many big up days. By big up days, I'm talking 2% gains, right? I mean, we have 2% gains all the time now, and the market's still 20% off the highs. So just kind of unique to think about, but what we just went through was truly, truly um, just devastating in so many different ways. But we're going to talk about potentially some of the positives that are taking place. Actually, Chris, maybe go back to that. I should have mentioned the, the quote, um, the quote at the top, Carl, Carl Richards. He is a uh, famous financial uh, journalist. He says, risk is what is left over after we've thought of everything else. Well, think about that. We thought of everything. The economy looked pretty good. Things were okay. Well, the risk that was left over was the unseen black swan of the, uh, the 50 year flu in essence is what it is. I'll talk about that in a second, but the coronavirus. So that's why we just had the fastest bear market ever. So now let's go to the next one, please. Thanks. So, you, you know, I've had people say you can't compare this to anything else. And I can't totally disagree. I mean, again, we had an economy that's moving along. Think about a car. How do you stop your car? You pump the brakes, you slam on the brakes, or you could hit a tree, right? Our economy, to be, honest, to be blunt, hit a tree. And we've never seen a situation like this where the economy truly stops. Um, at the same time, we were looking into the last, there's this, this is the, we're in a recession. We are the camp, we are in a recession right now. You look at the data, we're in a recession. This is the 13th recession going back to World War II. There's never been a recession that the government technically caused. You think about it, the government caused the recession because they told everyone to stay inside. Why did they do that? The near-term pain that we're going to experience this quarter and maybe some into the third quarter to make things better in the future, right? We're taking some major pain. I mean, Goldman Sachs came out and said a 34% annualized decline in GDP this quarter. I mean, we're going to see some of the worst economic numbers anyone's ever seen in their lifetime over the coming months. And the question is, well, you know, look at the stock market. We just saw, well, the stock market's been up the last couple of weeks, right? I mean, last week, the headline that the President of the United States and the White House say 100,000 to 240,000 Americans could die, yet the stock market was down only 2% last week. It's just so, I mean, as terrible as that is for the economy and for those that are impacted, we've all have been impacted, we all know someone impacted by this um, directly or indirectly. The reality is the stock market is a forward-looking mechanism. The day that 6.6 .6 million people filed for initial claims, or at least it was announced last Thursday, they filed the week before, Six, a record 6.6 .6 million people lost their jobs, um, the stock market was up 2%. The week before, 3.3 .3 million people lost their jobs, stock market gained 6%. I mean, what I'm getting at is so much negative things have been priced in, if we can avoid the, the devastating worst-case scenarios, stock market tends to look forward. Look at what happened on, uh, it was Sunday, uh, Bill Gates, who's, by the way, giving $100 million from the Gates Foundation to try to help this uh, pandemic. So thank you, Bill Gates. Bill Gates said, if we do this for eight more weeks, this being social distancing, he thinks that 100,000 number is going to be wildly high. You know, I mean, there are tragically thousands of deaths literally every day now are piling up, but we're kind of in the, the meat of it. We really think we're a week or so away from maybe a peak potentially new cases, which could be a major plus. But we're doing the right things, right? The social, we're all in our houses, or I'm, I'm, I come to my office, I shut that door, and I don't see anybody. I just stay in here. Then I go home and don't talk to anybody and do the same thing. I mean, we're all at home working. Um, it, it, you know, we're doing the right things. Well, what's going to save us from this, or get us out of it, I should say? It's not the Fed. It's not the government. It's social distancing, and it's scientists. I mean, that's what's going to get us out of it. So again, this is like nothing we've ever seen before. And to just prove it, you know, look at the screen now. Now, look at the slide I've got. These are some previous outbreaks the last 20 years. I mean, these are some big ones, right? A lot of deaths, terrible, terrible. 
the stock market took them, you could argue, relatively in stride. I mean, you see one month, three months, six months later, a lot of, a lot of positive numbers. And again, they tell us, you know, one of the first things you learn in this industry, but I've been doing this 21 years, this time is different. The form of John, Sir John Temple, the four most dangerous words is this time is different. Well, the reality is this outbreak and this reaction and this uh, stoppage of the largest economy in the world, it is different. We've really never seen anything quite like this one. So let's go to the next chart, please. Um, what is it? So, okay, so we're going to talk about uh, our country has been through a lot of bad things. You can kind of scan the list here as I talk a little bit. Since nine, the Panic of 1907 was one of the worst financial crises we've ever had. They compared it to 2008, to be honest. It just runs on banks. It led to a terrible recession, depression. It really led to the creation of the Fed about five or six years later. So that's where we started with this. You can see all these terrible things that have happened. Here's the truth. Um, from an, ec an economic point of view, a lot of those led to terrible recessions and really hurt a lot of people. From a stock market point of view, let's go to the next slide, Chris. You'll see, we looked at it with our friends from Ned Davis, future returns, the stock market can kind of get through a lot of them, right? Now, I probably should update this, but 20, it says 22 days, that's a month, okay? 63 days is three months, 126 is six months, 253 days is actually a full year, that's trading days. The reality is stock markets have been through a lot of bad, or I'm sorry, the economies in our country have been through a lot of bad things that we have overcome all of them over, over time. Um, and we do see, see, once again, as terrible as this is, from an economic point of view and from a stock market point of view, we really are going to overcome. And for history, since 1907, we have eventually overcome things. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And, and I'll, I've always liked that. I like looking at historical backdrops and data to try to show maybe where, where a path for the future will be. And again, a pandemic like this is something that we've really never seen before. But look at this. In 1918, we had a probably the worst pandemic that we've had since the, the Black Plague, which was in the 1350s. And 50 million people died globally, as you can see there, 675,000 um, deaths uh, from the U.S. The stock market, based on the Dow, lost 33%. Now, you got to put some context around this. This took place right after the, the, the um, World War I, the Great War. From 1914 to 1917, there are 15 million people that died in World War I. Nearly half of the people that died in World War I were um, civilians. I mean, I didn't realize this until I started reading about it. In World War I, people didn't even wear helmets until near the end I mean, of, of the war. I mean, think about that. But it happened, and the stock market lost 33%. 50 years later, you have another major, major flu, major pandemic, Stock market loses 36%. Now, again, it's never quite as simple as looking back and saying, oh, 36% loss because of the pandemic. There are some other absolutely things going on in the late 60s in our country. But every 50 years, we've had a flu and we've had a big stock market sell off. Here we are 50 years later with a terrible pandemic that's taking place and the stock market just pulled back 34%. Now, sadly, those numbers that we show on the screen for the recent one are wildly low. I mean, it's about a you know, week or two old, week or so old. So we need to update those numbers. They are much higher. But on the stock market side of things, isn't it unique that 50 years apart, you have big sell-offs, and 50 years apart, you have a terrible, terrible 50-year flu pandemic, and stock market bottoms right around here. Now, again, no one knows this is the bottom, but it's just kind of something to be aware of um, with what's going on. So let's go to the next chart. It's just another list of all some, some really big geopolitical events that we've seen kind of some of the stock market reaction after the fact. Um, you can see the bottom Pearl Harbor, total pullback of about 20% or so. Um, you know, after the terrorist attack 9-11, about a 12% correction. What I like to point out is the days to recovery on the right there. You know, about 45 calendar days or so, so about a month and a half, a lot of these bad things that took place, we recovered. Again, that's why this one's different, because this pullback has been much more, and it's going to take much longer to recover. But again, I just want to point out, I mean, when did we start here? Okay, we started Pearl Harbor, 1941. I mean, those are some terrible things that took place. Again, probably not as terrible as what we're dealing with now, but we've always recovered in the end from a stock market point of view and from an economic point of view. And we think that's absolutely uh, the case once again here um, as all kind of lay out. Let's go to the next one, please. So this is a neat one. Just This is a neat, hopefully a big picture thing to explain. 
uh, since people who are concerned about you, you get your statements in the mail, right? You get your statements in the mail, and, and it sounds like you know, hopefully the models you guys have did really well, which is great. But still, I mean, you know, when you have a 20% decline in the S&P in the first quarter, you're probably going to see your stocks were down a little bit, and 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 that's reality of things. But here's the thing to be aware of. You pick any random day, a year later, S&P would be higher 68% of the time. 20 years later, as you can see, higher 96% of the time. The reality is, yes, if you bought at 1929's peak, if you bought at you know 1968's peak, if you bought at the 2000 peak, you bought at 2007 peak, or you, I guess you could say you bought about a month ago uh, before the sell-off or two months ago, yes, those were some poor times to buy when you're at highs. The reality is when stock markets are really off their highs, though, these returns I'm showing you get even better. People say all the time, Ryan, okay, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> well, here's what I'm doing. I've got a 401k with LPL that I put money in every two weeks when I get paid. I've drastically upped the um, 401k contribution. We can put so much per year in 401k. I'd rather put a lot of money in my 401k when the stock market's 25, 30% off the tides, right? I have no idea if March 23rd was the lows. What I do say is look at this chart in front of you. Five years from now, 10 years from now, I'm not going to retire. I'm not planning on retiring anytime soon. I don't need that money for decades. So I'd rather buy it low. So I'm putting a little more in. My kids have a 529 plan, college education plan. Put money in every quarter, kind of automated. Well, I've mailed some checks. And it's funny, 529 is actually mailed the checks. Nonetheless, I've mailed some checks to put a little extra money in with stocks down 25, 30%. Again, my son is seven. He's, he's, done, he's not going to college for a while. But I'd still rather put a little more money in now than when the s and P's you know, new all-time highs. I mean, trust me, I'll put it in when the stocks are all-time highs, too. But it just feels like a better better time to do it. And this old saying, old joke about the stock market, stock market's the only place where things go on sale, yet people run out of the store screaming. And it's kind of a playful little thing, but it's true, right? I mean, you know, these tell us stocks are usually going to come back if your time frame is long enough. Uh, so those are just some big picture things to uh, to be aware of. Uh, let's go to the next chart. So this is neat. I wrote about this. Um, we've got a blog, lplresearch.com. I wrote about this, I guess it was yesterday, on our blog. Um, and a lot of the charts that I'm sharing today have come straight from our blog, um, lplresearch.com. But the idea that stocks bottom before the economy. So here's what we mean. The stock market is a forward-looking mechanism. I mean, the stock market really started selling off way before the terrible headlines that we've been seeing this week and last week, right? I mean, stock market actually bounced since these terrible headlines started. If you look at the bond market, the bond market really started getting worried back in February with the yields globally just crashing and everyone's looking around like, what is going on here? And then you look back, oh, the bond market was sensing something was wrong. The oil markets crashed as well. Now, that's a little different what was going on there. But all these volatility happened in different markets, and eventually those dominoes knocked over the stock market. But what we're going to see, and you can see on the screen here, we're making the assumption that we just started the recession in March of last year. It's not official yet, but when you look at the data, I think it's going to be official soon enough here. Um, so we're one month into a recession. The average recession lasts, lasts about 11 months. Um, the last recession we had was the Great Recession. And we, you can see 18 month uh, length there, which is the longest recession since the Great Depression. Now, what's interesting is when does the market bottom relative to when the recession ends? Well, you can see they're all a little different, but the reality of the fact is the majority of the time, stocks bottom first, they start going up, and then eventually the recession's over. Stocks are sniffing out better, um, better opportunities, better times. The only time, you can see on the right there, that negative 11, the only time the recession ended and stocks kept going down was the tech bubble in 2000, 2000 2001, 2002, and all the accounting scandals as well that took place. Stocks went down 11 more months that time in the early 2000s. But all the other times, you see stocks bottom well before the economy turns around. So what we're getting at here is there are going to be days when we just get horrible, horrible headlines yet the stock market's up, and we've seen some of those already, actually. So we, we really think that, you know, this, this is a, an opportunity where the stock market can, can tell us better times are ahead, just like they were kind of warning us really scary times were ahead. Um, something unique about right now, but I don't even know the answer, it's just more of an interesting bullet point. If March 23rd was the low of this, this sell-off, which so far is, um, and also March started a recession, it's the first time in history that a recession started 
the same month the stocks bottomed. Now, we don't know if the recession officially started, although we think it did, and we have no idea if March 23rd was actual lows. I mean, we think there's probably a three and four chance those were the lows. Um, but again, it's just unique that that's what's going on. And you think about this, how quickly we went down on the stock market and just the economy went off a cliff as well. You know, if we can put, if the virus can be contained, if the benefits of fiscal policy and monetary policy, which I'll talk about here, that double bazooka, we wouldn't be surprised at all if some of the economic growth in the fourth quarter came back really strong. And as bad as this data is going to be, probably the worst data we're all going to see in our lifetime in the second quarter from a U.S. economic point of view, the fourth quarter might be some of the best economic data on the snapback, um, on the snapback higher. And we, we can all, you know, hope's not a strategy. I hate to say we can only hope, but in this case, we can hope that that's kind of the case. And again, doctors are, are going to solve this. Social distancing is going to solve it. If we do those things, we think that, you know, several more, a couple more months of pain could really be um, worth it in, in the end. Let's go to the next chart, please. So people say all the time, Ryan, what's your favorite chart? There it is. Pie I've eaten, pie I've not eaten yet. <laughs> it's a, yeah, a little silly thing. So there's a lot of pie to eat. So I like to talk through images and charts, and there's my favorite chart. So well, let's go to the next one here. So this is neat. This is a neat one. And this is one, this is again, one of those big picture things that, that hopefully kind of help explain, you know, okay, all the scary news, but let's take a big view on things. The reality of the fact, this is the S&P 500 annual returns. I don't know how far back we went, probably the 50s, I assume. Um, the reality of the fact is, as you can see, on the right side, there's a lot more of those numbers that were up 15%, 20%, 25% or more than were down that level. Doesn't mean you can't be. 2008, 74, as you can see, 2002 and 73 were horrible, horrible years. This year is obviously a pretty terrible year. I think as we speak, or before this started, S&P is down 18% or so for the year right now. But we think, you know, say we're down, let's just say 20. Let's say we're down 20% for the year, which is pretty close on the S&P. You know, with all that's going on, we really think at the end of the year, we're going to be more in the middle there. We're probably going to be down for the year. I mean, we were down 34% just a few weeks ago. That's going to be, that'll be a record bounce. The most any year has ever been down year to date to finish green was in 2009. Stocks are down 25% um, into early March. Then they finished up well over 20%. 2009 was obviously a major low, and then, and then a major high or a major major bull market started. But in reality, the fact is, yes, stocks are probably going to be down because we had such a, you know, a curveball with the, with the terrible pandemic that took place. But again, the reality is, we could have a huge down year if this gets worse and things spread. Then sure, absolutely, we could have uh, you know a negative 25% uh, year. That's really not our base case. And as I said earlier. We manage money. Right before this call, I was on a call with uh, 12 members of my team, and we're talking about what we want to do. What's LPL, the kind of way we're looking, is this is these are opportunities, right? We don't think that this is going to be a major, major 50% haircut. We think this is going to be more of an opportunity with some of the positives that can come into the future. And again, history shows most years are up years, but also history shows it's rare. Let's say we're down this year 10%. I mean, I think most of us right now would take that with all the volatility that's out there. Let's say we're down 10% this year, just hypothetical. It's very rare for stock markets to be down two years in a row. It can happen, 73, 74, three years into the tech bubble, that's about it. I mean, it, it, you know, so you can have a down year, you tend to see that snapback. So for people that are concerned, we're down this year potentially, just playing the, playing the playbook in history, yes, now I know this time is different, we've got this terrible pandemic going on, but again, the economy has screeched to a halt. If it can see forward-looking better times, we we could really snap back uh, pretty pretty significantly is kind of where we're uh, where we're looking and with the money that we run now we're not just blindly adding all over the place but we are actively looking for some places to add a little bit of risk by that I mean a little bit of equity exposure relative to bonds uh, let's go to the next chart so the playbook this is something we released um, all well, about a month ago at this point probably but Bert White our CIO chief investment officer kind of did something like this in 2008 and it's more of a Step by step, what are we looking for? You know, just because stocks are cheap, or we got to sell off, that's or that people are scared, like I showed on that first slide with the uh, left number one on the CNN Fear and Greed Index. We want to see multiple things line up for more of a more of a confidence level that we've hit a major market low. And the good news is we're, we're quite close on these. Number one, and probably the most important, which we're not there yet, is the confidence in the number of peak of coronavirus cases in the United States. Uh, we've seen some some inklings of some good news. We've seen definitely, uh, if you look at some of the hot spots, New York and other areas, 
Less and less people are getting this. There are more deaths have happened tragically, but less and less new cases. Number of people in hospitals are declining. I saw today, or no, yesterday, China and the entire country of China said there are no new cases. Now, let's be honest. No one truly trusts China, um, but, but that's what they said. And the Wuhan province, where all this started, where everything started there back, I guess it depends who you ask, but it sounds like it started back in October there, um, if not earlier. They today, after a 76 day lockdown, just said that people can freely walk around. You know, the number of cases in Italy and deaths in Spain, those things have started to trickle lower as well. So we're not there from the U.S. point of view yet. We're probably two weeks away if you look at kind of forecasting. But that's a positive sign if the number of cases finally peak. Number two is visibility of a recession. When we rolled this out a month ago, we actually were saying, ah, 50-50 chance we're in a recession. That's not the case anymore. We're in a recession. But from a, a, a unique way, market hates uncertainty. Are we or aren't we in a recession? Right? That's why we, had, we think had such a significant rally a couple weeks ago when it said 6.6 .6 million people are losing their jobs and you have a 6% rally in the stock market. Doesn't make any sense. Well, it's the certainty that we're in a recession. And what happens when you're in a recession? Well, there's going to be fiscal stimulus, a monetary stimulus, and different things in play to try to help that. And that's kind of why stock's forward-looking. Markets priced in a recession down 34% recently. That's, that's market pricing in a recession. Talked about number four, uh, the overall kind of sentiment indicators. There's a lot of fear recently, and that's a recipe for a major market low. And then the policy response, which I'll talk more about, is the fiscal and monetary policy response globally and in the U.S. There's a lot of kindling there for, um, for some potential. Any good news with the, with the COVID-19 epidemic? or pandemic, sorry, that, that there can be some positives from all that the government has done to try to create a bridge to help people that were impacted, and we'll get into that. Uh, let's go to the next chart. I think it's uh, peak cases, let's see, yep. So you can see here, here's the number of um, new confirmed daily deaths, a three-day average. Just uh, yesterday, you saw a little bit of a tick lower for the United States, and again, it's a horrible, horrible chart to see. I mean, just, you know, in the United States, is just soaring. But from an investment's point of view, you can see Spain, Italy, UK, all trending lower. The US is starting to trend lower as well, and it's very early. Uh, but if we continue to do the social distancing, we really think that can be the play. And that can be something the market really, really wants to see or needs to see for a major type of a bottom to take place. So let's go to the next chart. We're we doing time-wise. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll go about another 10 minutes or so, then we'll do Q&A, so we should be good. Um, don't forget the Chinese word for crisis. The Chinese word for crisis is two symbols, danger and opportunity. So anytime there's a crisis, there is danger. There's no doubt about it. But there's also opportunity, and that's the Chinese word for crisis. So we'll keep it as high level. The credit markets, I think, are the smartest guys in the room, whether you look at things like high yield bonds or investment grade corporate bonds. So what kind of the bond market is saying, different parts of the bond market is saying in the credit markets? If they're worried, and by worried, you can see that big spike up on the right, that means they're worried. That means we're in a recession, okay? The reality of the fact is when, when the credit markets freak out like that, they're the smartest guys in the room, and they weren't freaking out until about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and then they went vertical like they just did. But check it out. We're nowhere near the level of credit stress that we had in 2008, which <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll take some good news and a sea of bad news. And when you look into it a little bit more, What's unique about this, there are different types of credit spreads you can look at. If you look at financial company credit spreads, we're nowhere near the level that we were in 2008. Um, you know, now average companies, yes, they're pretty high, but that's why we think this is not a financial crisis. This is a business crisis. Look at the first people to lose their jobs in 2008, rich Wall Street bankers, okay? Bears turns in March 2008. Everyone kind of saw it on TV. We didn't really pay attention to it until September of 2008 when the stock market started getting killed. And then October, it really got killed. Things got ugly. And then people started losing their jobs into 2009, and we had a recession. But it's just unique because what happened this time, it's not a financial crisis. It started on Main Street, right? There were 700,000 people lost their jobs last month, according to the data that we just got. 400,000 of those jobs that were lost were from restaurants or bars, okay? And that's why it's so unique because – we think that's why the government helped so quickly, right? It took only a couple weeks to get the CARES Act, the $2 trillion fiscal plan in play. Now, whether you, you like it or you don't, it's not perfect. It's, it's, by no means is it perfect. But the fact that so many regular people were impacted by what's happened, by losing their jobs, the CARES Act was put in place so fast. I mean, you think about it, the, the, we'll call it bailout for the banks, really, is what it was in 2008. That didn't happen until, like, October. 
stuff started getting bad in March. You talk to financial people, the financial companies are in trouble in March. It took months before that bailout happened, really, before the stock market started going down. Well, this time, it was in a couple of weeks. Now, trust me, we had a stock market that went down, but we, we got some benefits um, to help the small businesses and the consumers that were just so so immediately and, and will be continue to be impacted by this uh, this really shutdown that, was, that the government has installed on us for the right reason. We're, we're for it, but that's the reality of things. Now, let's go to the next chart. Let's see what I have here. So not all bear markets uh, lead to a recession. So honestly, at this point, we're in a recession. But when I created this chart, they were kind of asking the question, will we be in a recession or not? But what I want to point out is um, the length of these bear markets. You can see the average bear market lasts about a year. Okay? If you're in a recession, 18 months. Well, like I just said, we're probably in a recession. So does that mean we could have a long way to go here? I mean, that's not our base case, but just something to be aware of. Because this decline, here's the, what's more important, I think, though, the, the, the magnitude of the decline. The average bear market in a recession, as you can see in front of you there, 37%. We just corrected 34%. Again, Mr. Stock Market is saying we just had a recession, and as violent as that was, we just had the best two-week rally in stocks since 2009, okay? And we're bu building, I think, I mean, well, we were up 2% on the S&P before I started this. I'm not sure where we are now. But still, as quickly as things went down, we really are getting a snapback on, on the uh, way up. And I want to talk about that for a second because people wonder, well, do you just, you know, if someone had some money and they said, when, when, when do you add? I mean, it's such a difficult question. But if you look back at history, when you have these major crashes, 1987, October, there was a 15% rally into November or so. The ultimate lows didn't happen until December of 87. Most people forget that. You think about 2008. Um, or let's go to 2002. October 2002, major stock market crash, major low, pretty decent bounce, retested the lows in March 2003. 2008, what happened? A huge crash into October, then an, almost a 27% bounce late 2008, rolled over, broke the lows, and made lows in March of 2009. Um, various, what I'm getting at is, and we've written about this and talked about it, markets, when they crash, they have a bounce. We're in the middle of a bounce right now off the lows kind of we call it dead cat bounce, if you will. And then you go back and retest, and will this time, will we go all the way back down and retest the March 23rd lows? We don't think that's the case, but believe me, a move back lower to really get some fear is an opportunity where we're gonna to add to some, uh, some equity exposures, how LPL at least is looking to play that right now. But just be aware that um, the odds of this bounce that we're seeing here, is it the lows and is it the best time to go in? You know, if you dollar cost average or things like that, maybe, but history would say maybe a little more of a low move lower is kind of what we're looking for. Now, let's go to the next chart, please. This is what I was kind of talking about. Bear markets are fierce. These are the worst bear markets in history on your screen there. Look at the, the top bounce during every bear market. For instance, the, um, uh, the time we lost 57% during a financial crisis, 56.8% there, 17-month bear market, there was a 27% bounce in the middle. During the bear market of two, early 2000s, a 25% bounce. There were six separate 10% bounces during the bear market of the early 2000s. I mean, bear markets are fierce. They're, they're historical. They go straight up, get everyone excited, and they kind of roll right back over. And that's, you know, that's kind of where we think we are right now. You tend to get some big bounces before ultimate lows happen. And you can see at the end of the day, it's about a 15% average is what the average um, bounce during a bear market is. So just, uh, just some context around the volatility we're seeing. Uh, let's go to the next chart. We've got a few more here. This is... Um, this is kind of a fun one. The screen's gonna move. Chris, go to the next slide, and the screen should start moving, I hope. Let's see, here we go. So if I just stare at that for a second, I'm gonna get a drink of water here. All right, go ahead and go to the next one. That is Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night. In all likelihood, it's moving all over the place. <laughs> it should be, at least, if that works correctly. Um, you know that that picture is not moving. Our brains are wonderful, wonderful things. They do a lot of good things. At the same time, our brains get us in trouble more often than not because we have something called recency bias. We see something one time, and we think, oh, that's how it happens every time. That's not the case. Oh, I'll do it again. There we go. <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, that's not the case because you need to go back further. And, again, our brains are great, but they can get us into trouble. So what I'm getting at this, let's go to the next slide here. And what we're looking for is what we really know because recency bias confuses what do we really know we just had an unbelievable washout i want to keep this high level and really simple 
This is the yellow line at the bottom is what I'm focusing on. This is a Bloomberg chart. The S&P 500 is the blue on top. The yellow is how many stocks are above their 200-day moving average. It's a geeky technical thing we look at. What you need to know is you can see that yellow line was as low as we got since 2008. Okay. Now look at 2008 for a second on the left there, that yellow. It stayed low for a while before it started to go back up. Well, the stock market kept going down in 2008, early 2009, as we remember. It wasn't until really this yellow line perked up that we saw some improvement under the surface. And that's kind of something, well, not something, we are watching this every single day. We want to see that yellow line get back up above 20, which is 20% of the stocks in the S&P 500 above their 200-day moving average. And that's kind of the hallmark of a, okay, now we feel comfortable that a fairly major low has taken place. And we're we're not there yet, but we're watching it. But this is just, again, we're nearing a washout. It's a necessary evil for a um, for a major stock market low to take place. And again, we're, we're inching closer to, you know, a couple more good days, we, we could be there. Although we're not sure about when it'll happen. You know, in 2008, people thought, you know, that was oversold in October and thought it'd be a good time to buy. And the stocks are 25% lower in March than they were in October 2008. So you want to see some improvement before, at least from our point of view, before we just kind of really go go all in here. Uh, next chart, got a few more, I think we're about done. Um, this, okay, so we'll talk about the Federal Reserve for a second. A lot of people don't like the Federal Reserve, they just print money. I, I get all of the, the concerns and the, the, the issues with the Fed. The reality of what the Fed is doing here though, the Fed's trying to do two things, create liquidity and create confidence. Now, the Fed is doing a lot of things to do those things. What's the Fed also done historically? When the Fed expands its balance sheet, meaning they're buying assets to try to prop up liquidity and confidence, that is usually a time stock markets do well. You look back when the Fed expanded the balance sheet after the financial crisis, stock markets did well. That's the catch here. Did it really help the economy? No. We just had a 10-year cycle of growth that averaged like 2% GDP the whole time per year. Okay, Stock market was up 400% though. So what the Fed is doing is not going to help the economy. Um, but but it potentially from this conversation and this call, what the Fed is doing very, very well could help risk assets and help the um Help stocks, and you can see all the different things the Fed has done. They're doing some unique things they didn't even do in 2008. I mean, they're dusting off stuff that's brand new uh, from that point of view. So just the old saying, "Don't fight the Fed." Well, the Fed balance sheet was up over a trillion dollars the last two weeks, up to over five trillion dollars all-time record. Again, whether you like it or not, it's something that we do not want to be betting against necessarily. And again, this is a kindling for down the road what the Fed is doing to uh, potentially help equity prices. Uh, the next thing, let's go to the next one. This is the CARES Act, the $2 trillion stimulus plan. And again, I've talked about this a little bit already, but we look at this like a bridge. My, my, my father-in-law in Cincinnati owns a restaurant. It was one of the more popular restaurants in Cincinnati. We'd go back and it place would be packed every night, use open table, right? All the tables are booked. Take a guess, you know, his business has just stopped. I mean, they're worried how they're gonna pay their mortgage next month. I mean, everyone knows someone like this, but the CARES Act, I've, I've talked to him about it every night almost, and he's go, getting into it and trying to get the, the loan and. You know, he's not super thrilled. There are some catches, some hoops you got to jump through to get the money, and then you got to do certain things the government tells you to do. But the bottom line is he needs the money because he just had to lay off a bunch of workers, but he wants to bring all those workers back. And it, it's, a, it's a very fine line, I'm aware. I don't want to get into too much in the politics on it. But the reality is the CARES Act is necessary to help people like that who have a successful restaurant that want to open this restaurant up in two or three months. But they need money, right? They, they can't keep the restaurant open because there's literally no money coming in. So that's exactly why this was created. And it, it's helping those people that are impacted the most, whether it be the, the consumers who lost their jobs, the like 10 million people last two weeks, or people like that, my father-in-law, the small business owners uh, that, that need the help. And there's all the different things you can see on the line. We're helping the industries that are most uh, most impacted, things like airlines specifically. Um, and, but it's, it's more of a bridge. Now, the reality of the fact is there's likely more of these coming. This is kind of the third stimulus package. We've already had two smaller ones. There's a, yesterday, Nancy Pelosi was floating idea of another tr a trillion, who's counting, right? A trillion dollar stimulus package, which maybe, which would focus on the people most directly impacted, the individuals, but also maybe an infrastructure plan. You know, you go to, um, you drive around on, um, you know, um, highways or look at our, look at our railroads and look at our airlines. We probably could use a major infrastructure change. And that's maybe the time to do it will be one of these incoming stimulus plans. Uh, coming down the road. But last thing about this, the GDP, which is kind of our overall country's economy, is $22 trillion. So if you do the math, this stimulus plan was about 9% of the U.S. GDP. 
What's that mean? The bailout we got in 2008 for the banks was 5% of GDP. So in other words, that took months to kind of get done. This, in a couple weeks, we got 9% of GDP. Now, no time is, this time is different because again, the economy stopped this time. It didn't stop back then. You could argue the financial market stopped back then, but believe me, the total economy didn't start, stop back then. But still, how quickly we got such a big juice uh, for the, the economy with a $2 trillion plan with probably another $1 trillion plan down the pike here in a month or so. Um, those, are, those are those bridges that are necessary to help the people most impacted by this. Um, let's go to the next chart. What are we doing here? We're, we're good. How long do we recover? People ask us all the time. And the bottom line is the further down the stock market goes, the longer it'll probably take to get back to new highs. And that's just math. But if you look at it here, it takes about 30, or it's um, about 20 months on average after a bear market bottoms. And again, you never really know until after the fact when a bear market bottom, but about 20 months on average for a recovery. I like to compare this to 87 because it's one of the similar big crashes that happened. Um, you see 87 dropped 34%, right about where we dropped right now. Took 20 months to recover. We think that, that could be the case. The reality of the fact is we're not just going to bounce right back to new highs. I mean, I, let's, I hope we do, you know. But again, history would say it's going to take a while. But from an investor's point of view, let's, let's take some time down here and maybe consolidate. It gives, it gives investors time to figure out what they want to do, you know, work with, work with Scott and Chris, see about what you want to do with your investments. But longer term, as I've laid out many times, your markets tend to go higher, so it gives us a little bit of time to, um, to see how quickly we need that money and how aggressive we want to be with stocks down here. But they'll, they'll, they'll come back. It's just not going to happen overnight. Let's go to the next chart, Chris. See here. So this is a little geekier, but it's called the equity risk premium. It's just how stocks are relative to bonds, and I'll just keep this extremely high level. Stocks are very, very cheap, historically cheap relative to bonds, and that's what that high blue line is. So our take at LPL Research is always a place for fixed income in somebody's um, portfolio. But you know what we're looking at doing is for the next five to 10 years, it really makes sense to us that stocks will do a little bit better, maybe a lot better than bonds going forward. And the equity risk premium describes that. If you wanted to read more about that, you can go to our website, lplresearch.com, there's a search bar, type in equity risk premium. We've talked about it before, but we'll just keep that one high level. Uh, next one, I think we've only got a couple more. Yeah, this is I think the last. I always make a joke that I talk politics on my last two slides and I leave. <laughs> but um, here we have, um, can the economy predict the next president? Now, I, I shared this two months ago and it kind of had a different tilt to it, obviously. The reality is yes. If you look back in history, if there's a recession two years before the um, election, a recession means the incoming, incoming president tends to lose. If there's not a recession, the incoming president tends to win. You can see there, when there were recessions, it was, let's see here, Ford, Carter, and Bush all um, saw recessions and lost, right? And all the rest of the guys didn't have recessions and they won. The economy has been right every single time back to Calvin Coolidge in 1924. There was a recession before that. But you think about that, that was the roaring 20s. That recession happened a couple of years before the election. Then the economy really started to get going and he won, even though there was a recession technically two years before the um election, which kind of brings us to now. Yes, we're in a recession, right? Does that just mean President Trump's going to lose? Well, you know, nothing's ever that simple because let's say the COVID-19 crisis calms down a little bit with all the fiscal stimulus and all the monetary stimulus that we have in play. Could the economy really be picking up by the time the election comes around? You know, there's a chance of that. So, you know, I don't, I don't have the answers at all. I don't want to have the answers, but I'm just laying out that uh, kind of how the economy is doing ahead of an election sometimes going to uh, show who might be on the White House. Uh, the last chart, Chris, the last one is kind of along the same lines. What do stocks know? Stocks know a lot. 20 of the last 23 elections, the stock market accurately predicted who's going to win the presidency. What I mean by that, if the S&P 500 is up three months before or down three months before. If stocks are up, the incumbent party wins. If stocks are down, the incumbent party loses. It's not perfect, but it has a pretty good track record. And let's go to 2016 for a second, and then we'll, then we'll do Q&A. The stock market, I'm sorry, everyone, including Elta Research, thought Hillary Clinton was going to win. Okay, we wrote it. Everyone thought that. The stock market didn't. The Dow had a record, near record, nine-day losing streak directly ahead of the election. Copper, more of an industrial slash President Trump play. Copper had a record. 14-day win streak directly ahead of the 2016 November election. You think back to that, so everyone thought Hillary would win, not the stock market, not the copper market. So there's other markets, intermarket analysis sometimes might be telling us clues. So as we get closer to this election, how the economy is doing, how copper is doing, how the stock market is doing, how some of these things are doing, 
maybe can give a little bit of a clue as to who will win the um, presidency in November and then obviously be in the White House in January. So, so I think that's it. Let's go to the next one and try this lawyer stuff. Yeah. So, okay, guys, we've got yeah, t well, how much time you need. I got plenty of time, but I'm wrapping it up. But thank you for having me and uh, let's fire away with questions. Thank you, Ryan. I am, uh, I'm going to unmute everybody now. So uh, please, let's take it one at a time. I'll try and uh, handle this how I can. Uh, so, all right, everyone is unmuted. If your uh, kids are in the room or cats and dogs, we'll hear them too. So take your time. Um, if you, you might have, I see a few people are still muted. You might have been muted yourself. So uh, if you have a question, uh, you're gonna have to take yourself off unmute. Um, so uh, I also want to say before we start questions, we're going to um, uh, try and keep this to a very high level, um, uh, just due yeah, to the personal nature of I can hear someone there. Just the personal nature of what we do. We uh, we want to keep this to high level. If you have any specific uh, questions on your investments in your account, Scott and I are available to, to talk to you personally on that. All right. Um, also, let me just Lindsay give me here. I'm on a, I don't know if you can hear. I'm on a um, conference call, a uh, uh, Zoom on the other line. I'll be over in a few minutes, and I'll call you back. I'll call you yeah, back. we can all hear you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. There we go. Any questions? Any questions? Hey. I mean, hey, Chris. Oh, yeah, Ryan. Yeah. So, uh, Al Alan Hark, I'm a CPA partner with LPL, uh, along with Alan. Scott and Chris on their team. How are you? Doing well, um, doing well. Thank you. Good, good. So, um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. It was great. And um, how, do you, how do you see um, playing in? Well, one thing we're going to have an awful lot of is unemployment. Yep. Um, and, I, you know, in my mind, I'm trying to think, is it going to last for a long time at a high level, or is it going to come down to a, you know, a more natural level quickly? And is it an opportunistic time to get into infrastructure, as an example, to employ people? Um, because we're, we're a consumer-based economy that depends on people spending money. People are going to have fear of spending money. People are going to have fear of being in the public. Um, how does that? I mean, how do you? How does that hit the markets at all? Yeah, no, great question there. And I will say, since we did this presentation, the stock market was up a little bit. So, hey, I thought that's good. Uh, we're at some piece of 3% as we speak. But the reality of the fact is this. You're not just going to start the largest economy in the world after stopping it. Right? We can say, let's just say two months from now, okay, everybody, everything's back to normal. Go out there. Are you going to go on a cruise? You know, are you really going to take your kids to a baseball game? I mean, I, I want to hang out with my neighbors, drink a beer, eat some eat some burgers. You know, I mean, I, 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 we're, we're wondering how quickly you can turn it back on. And that's what makes it so, so tough because, you know, is the is the medicine worse than the cure? You know, I mean, it's like it, it's um, you're really impacting so many people. But getting to your question, we don't see, you know, is it a V recovery on the economy? You know, that I mean, the straight down and then straight back up. We don't think so. I mean, it, it, it might be like a W kind of or a square root, if you will. It's going to be so, so tough for just companies to just hire right back when they, when what's happened is happening. And that's, that's just the, the harsh truth. Now, I will say this, though. We did a study on uh, initial claims when you have the, the peak in initial claims. Well, let's be honest, that 6.6 .6 million we saw last week very well could be the peak most claims we're going to see in the cycle. It all happened right away. You look back in history, stock markets bottom about four weeks after the spike in claims. So, you know, from that point of view, could we be close, very close to a major low in the stock market? We do think so. But the reality of the fact is, again, like I said, the stock market's forward looking. So we're talking about two separate things. A lot of times the stock market and economy get along and they, they jive. Not now, right? In this environment, what's happening in the economy is just devastating, yet the stock market is bounced you know over 20 percent the last couple of weeks and now we're still down 15 percent for the year but hey it's 15 percent for the year so we we think it's going to be a tough recovery uh we do think you know the data by the fourth quarter should get a lot better but it's been no tough i've done it 21 years there's no tougher time to forecast right now because honestly 
Who knows what earnings are going to be by end of the year? You really don't, because if this gets worse, then, it, then all bets are off. It gets better if we get some type of a cure faster than the 12 to 18 months, or vaccine, I should call it, a vaccine faster than 12 to 18 months, most experts think, then that'd be wonderful. Uh, but we think it's going to be tough for companies to come back hiring within two months after, let's hope it's two months, when, when uh, you know the keys are kind of back and we're allowed to start coming out of our houses again. Right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Tough question, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I, no. I, I'll say no. I, one of the. Well, go ahead. Somebody there. Uh, you talked about the the long term effects of uh, uh, on the market and uh, and how you have to have a long view of uh, on your accounts, of course. The question becomes, what about those of us who are who don't have that long horizon? Mm -hmm. What about those who have the, the RMDs that become due on a uh, obviously on a short term basis now? So how do you address those particular things? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Well, I do know, um, you know, Chris, or do you guys have an opinion there? Because it does come down to the different. I mean, I've got an opinion. But it does come down to everyone's a little different. Um, I'll just say this much. Now is a great time with this balance that we've had where you can obviously work with Chris and the team to try to get your, get your uh, you know, stocks and assets and in an alignment. Um, at the same time, I've talked to people that say, you know, I'm going to retire in two or three years. I guess it's really important to say if you're going to retire in two or three years, it's not like you need all that money right away, right? You're hopefully you're going to need that money for the next couple of decades, to be honest. So that's where it's another level of thinking, but it's still um, don't just blindly ignore the fact that, you know, if you still have time during your retirement, there can be some substantial upside to, um, to, to, the, to the equities here still. Um, but it, it does come down to personal and individual basis. So I don't know, Chris, I mean, yeah, do you have I, an opinion there? Uh, I want to make sure I, I don't I step on too many toes with my opinion here. <laughs> Ryan, I have an opinion. It's Scott. Can you hear me? Yeah, Scott. There we go. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, again, uh, our clients really know in general our strategy that we're big dividend believers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, obviously they're going to matter to many of our clients in retirement. And like you said, Ryan, Everybody's story is different, but to the question it was just asked, you know, if you're closer to retirement, typically you start thinking, well, I need to shift my portfolio more into fixed income. The yep. challenge that we're faced right now is that fixed income rates are just so low that it typically cannot sustain your lifestyle uh, in the near future. Secondly, as one of the slides that, that was shown shows you that this is an opportunity to buy solid companies with good dividends at this point in the market. So uh, even though it's typically con contrary to what we typically believe in asset allocation or your mix in your portfolio of bonds versus stocks, I do think that you need to be a little bit slanted towards stocks, uh, especially mm -hmm. as the market or the economy is recovering, which it always has and always will. Uh, yep. So my answer to that question is, you need to be a little bit more stock, high quality companies, uh, dividend focused as much as possible, and obviously keep our eye on interest rates uh, where we could find opportunity in, mix, in fixed income. Chris, do, what do you think? Yeah, not to reiterate anything, uh, one different point as well would be for R&D specific, we are getting a, a, a holiday this year on RMDs. So everyone should know if you are, do have an RMD scheduled for 2020, you do not have to take that. That was part of the, the CARES Act that came out. Um, so those required distributions that you don't want to take, that you were forced to take in previous years, or maybe you're starting this year, you do get a holiday on that uh, just for, for 2020. So that's some good news that we won't have to do those distributions. You can remain invested for that portion. Yeah, good points. And I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. You think about after the tech bubble, well, it's called the tech bubble, right? What group didn't do well for almost 10 years? Technology. You think about the financial crisis, what groups did very poorly on a relative basis off of the blows in the financial crisis and for 10 years? The people that took the bailouts, your autos, your financial companies, your Fannies, your Freddies, those groups. So you think about right now, obviously, who's most impacted. It's kind of some of the consumer names, right? Some of those areas. Um, so if 
history repeats itself. Some of the groups that are the hardest hit or the groups that potentially take more of a government bailout, those are the ones that don't do as well. So as we look forward to the inevitable expansion and going higher, two, two favorite groups of LPLs are technology and healthcare. Technology still looks really good. It's where their earnings come from and healthcare. When you look at the COVID-19, which has happened, just an aging demographic. Those are two areas we think really can continue to do um, quite well potentially for years. And those are groups who are a little bit overweight here um, in the future. Not buying any cruise lines there, Ryan? <laughs> no, no, we're not. And that's kind of what I'm getting at is, you know, I mean, my neighbor, I literally yesterday I walked outside, my neighbor said, oh, so maybe two days ago, whenever the stock market had a big bounce, he goes, ah, I made 25% today. I'm like, 25%, what are you doing? He's like, I bought a bunch of cruise lines. And I'm like, oh my God, my own neighbor's doing that. I was like, no, you probably, I can't give recommendations, but I'll just say, that's risky. If you get a good day, get, get, take take it because history would say those groups are most impacted, like a cruise line or, or airlines, are probably going to be the ones that struggle the next several years, even during the recovery. So, are they looking to buy bridges too, or what? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Anybody? How will we be impacted if the virus comes back again next fall? Yep. Well, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, that's obviously the concern that we have is along with many others. And the reality of the fact is, I guess, we don't quite know yet. I mean, and I know that's not what you want to hear, right? I mean, the social distancing and things are working. It's working in China, where I said they're not even having new cases. But absolutely, the uncertainty is still there. And that's where I guess really, you know, if you work with Chris and Scott to kind of get your portfolio in a place where you're comfortable enough, if you're really worried about it coming back next fall. In our base case, we don't know. I mean, we just don't. And I don't want to, you know, sugarcoat things and be all Pollyanna. We don't know that. So you can shift your portfolio to be a little more defensive if that's a concern um, uh, that you have. But at the same time, you know, we're getting closer and closer to a vaccine. Johnson & Johnson just said they're spending a billion dollars along with the U.S. government. They're going to start human testing in September. You know, there are some lights at the end of the tunnel on this thing. But without a vaccine, it's very, very difficult to um, to truly think that we're out of the woods. And that's still quite a ways away is, is the sad truth. Yeah, um, could I just make a comment at, about uh, that question? It's it has my comment really has to do more with kind of wrapping up, and we'll certainly take more questions. But again, the market doesn't like uncertainty. We we know that that's just not good for the market. Um, I don't think the market personally. I don't think the market will have uh, solid or or we'll call it better footing until there is a vaccine uh, or and a vaccine and a treatment. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to be moving up and down here until there is some, some certainty. You know, the Fed's trying to make, create certainty with the liquidity adding to the markets, you know, creating more confidence in the market. We now have a little bit more on the political side. You know, I don't know if everyone knows, but Sanders dropped out of the race, so it adds a little yep. more certainty to one party in the race. Uh, all these things are actually good for the market, but the comment I wanted to make was, and hopefully it's not too much of a stretch of an analogy. Sometimes I get a little bit too philosophical, but, you know, this virus is, uh, the comparison is like a broken leg. It's, it's, you know, someone broke their leg, that's really bad. But then they go and they get their leg casted. And you still think, well, that's not good. It actually is good because getting it casted is you're on the way to recovery. So you have these good and bad things that happen at the same time. And I like to compare it to that broken leg in a cast because we are on our way, at least uh, in, in our belief in the practice, to more solid, uh, stable markets. However, it is based on a vaccine, and a treatment for this uh, horrible virus. Um, but uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing our best and doing very well with being good stewards with your money. And we know you worked long and hard for it and we take that very serious at practice. So go ahead with any more questions. I had to get that, that, that comment in. 
Yeah, what, I'll, I'll just add something too. And I think Ryan's slides kind of alluded to this or, or, or not even alluded, but pointed this out pretty clearly was that the markets tend to bottom way before we get all the good news, uh, sometimes several months. Um, and because the market is forward looking. So it's when things are the most scary, that we're the most uncertain, that tend to be the most opportune times to buy. So while there might be some fear of it coming back and that could create uh, you know, uh, a pull down in the market and that uncertainty, that's the time to have some dry powder on the side and to be taking advantage of it. So, I mean, Scott and I have kept some dry powder in the accounts. We continue to do that. We started putting money back to, to work uh, at the end of March when it felt like the world was gonna end, that we weren't gonna have a society anymore. Um, because it was just that scary and history has shown it wasn't easy for us to make those buys um, But it, it was the time to do it um, And if we get those events again, and I, I'm, I'm sure we will I'm sure there'll be some setbacks. It's not going to just be a, a straight road to recovery here uh, We think that it's it, it, we should be taking advantage of it Unless you think that we are at the end of society that we won't eventually be back to some type of normal uh, I think of like 9-11 we never went back to normal. You can't just run through an airport anymore. You can't run into an elevator building and go to any floor, but it's the normal that we expect. I imagine you won't be able to board an airport without your temperature being checked. There'll be a new normal after this, but we will get to some sense of normal. And we'll move on. Um, and if you don't think that society is going to continue from here on in some way, then we've all got bigger problems than money. Um, so, you know, we just don't think that's the case at all. And, and to be taking advantage, uh, of the market downturn, because um, we will recover. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yep. Yep. It's agreed. Any other questions? No, I'll, I'll just all end it with this. I'll, I'll jump in real fast. I'll just say, everyone on the line, you guys are in really good hands. I, I get to meet a lot of advisors, and and obviously, what what we just did today shows how proactive. Um, you know, Chris is and everyone on the team is about reaching out and asking me to come on and, and, and so many advisors have been hiding uh, during during this. So the fact that, you know, that's JK, they're right out in front. They're trying to help you guys. The stuff Scott is doing also and Chris, it's just it's awesome. It's very uplifting. So it's very scary. No one truly knows what's going to happen. We know what market history is. We know psychology, but, you know, work with them and they're on your side and it's, it's uh, uplifting for me. To, to kind of see how, how they're helping you guys. So just reach out to them. And if anything I can do, just reach out to me as well. So thank you so much guys for having me and hopefully get to do this in a few months. Maybe we got better news to talk about next time. Hey, Ryan, I just want to say uh, thank you to you and thank you to LPL. You know, you're our partners in all of this and for our clients. And uh, it's just great. It's not a commercial for LPL. Uh, it's just great knowing that we have in, in our opinion, the finest uh, broker dealer in the industry that's behind us. So thank you for being there and make sure you wash your hands walking around that office. <laughs> I don't, I'm trying to touch anything. I, I hear you. I am though. You're right. <laughs> All right. Thanks guys. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.